we've, uh, we have a special guest today, Steve Woodle, uh, who is returning to the University of Chicago, uh, where he spent how many years, Steve? Uh, ten years. Ten, ten years. <laughs> what, ten did years. Dick say plenty? <laughs> no, he's, uh, ten years. Uh, Steve is the professor and chief of the Division of Transplant Surgery at the University of Cincinnati. Uh, he, his MD was from University of Texas Medical Branch in Galveston, and he did his residencies in California, as well as fellowships in renal, pancreatic, and hepatic transplantation, which he did here at the University of Chicago. Uh, his research interests include solid organ transplantation, uh, paired kidney donation programs, chains, and immunotolerance questions. Um, in preparation for this introduction, I, I went back and I looked at a paper that, um, that Lainey Ross and Steve Woodle did, I think Dick was on it, uh, called Ethics of a Paired Kidney Exchange Program. There was a, a New England Journal paper in June of 1997. Uh, the idea of paired exchanges uh, had been introduced about 10 years earlier by Paul Terasaki at a conference, but nobody had ever really moved forward on the concept. And, and this paper in the New England Journal, Laney was the first author and Steve was the senior author, uh, really galvanized the field. And so many of the things that you see happening today, not just about pairs, but a sequence of pairs which have emerged as chains, uh, I, I think, derive uh, not just from the Terasaki suggestion of the 80s, uh, but, but from the revival of that in this New England Journal paper of 1997. Uh, Steve's topic today is ethics of kidney exchange, past, present, and future, and it's a pleasure to welcome you back, Steve. Thank you, Mark. Thanks, Mark. Um, can everybody see if I stand over here? I'd rather stand out here than be behind that, hiding behind that lectern. Um, so it's, uh, it's fun to come back uh, where you spent a large portion of your career. And really, my, my transplantation career was, was really formed and shaped by some of the people sitting around the table here. Um, and so if you hear some things that sound a lot like the University of Chicago, it's because I haven't forgotten everything that I learned when I was here. Um, so I want to take you on a, on a journey starting when we first started thinking about this issue and take you uh, through those period of years when we were here in Chicago and then what we've done in Cincinnati. I'm not going to be able to talk as much about the future because there's just not enough time in the talk, but for those of you that are interested in, in talking about the National Kidney Registry, which is probably the predominant program in the United States now, and some of the ethical issues associated with it, I'm happy to talk to you later on about it. We did hear a talk by, uh, by Garrett Hill. Yes, so Garrett's been here. Well, he, he was on, uh, but, but he didn't tell you about the ethical problems that he has with the, the registry. He has none. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so so from, from my perspective, you know, this is one of the real cradles of transplantation. If you look at this institution and its contributions, they're substantial. There's been 10 surgeons winning the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine. Two of those 10 won the Nobel Prize for work they did here at this institution. One in a building in a lab just over here with Charles Huggins for hormonal responses to cancers. But Alexis Carell came here just a few years after the university was founded at the turn of the century and in a building in a laboratory a couple of blocks away actually transplanted, learned how to sew vessels together and transplanted organs in uh, animals, in small animal. And his citation on his Nobel Prize is that he won that uh, for recognition of his work on vascular suture and the transplantation of blood vessels and organs. <clears throat> this is a guy that I learned surgery from. His name's Bill Blaisdell, and Blaisdell was actually a, a real giant in the field of surgery. He actually did some of his training with DeBakey and Cooley. He invented the uh, axillofemoral, axillofemoral bypass graft, which solved the problem of infected grafts that DeBakey and Cooley were getting. That was his job, he went in the lab. But he was the founding chairman at the UC Davis of Surgery. The library there at that institution is named for him now because of his scholarly contributions that he made. And he actually trained, I was actually one of his residents, and I actually got my job here as a fellow um, 
and I was really, really wanted that job because at that time, back in 1983, when I was looking for transplant fellowships, I wanted to do kidneys, pancreases, and livers, and there were only three programs in the country where you could do that, and this was one of them. And um, so he called this fellow, who was the guy who started clinical transplantation here, and Frank Stewart was one of his chief residents, one of his first chief residents at the Fort Miley VA in San Francisco. And I didn't even have to interview. I was granted the job based on the phone call. And so that's where my lineage goes back. These are some of the guys. I was really lucky, um, I think, as, as Dick was, that this guy came along uh, in 1984, 85, and established a liver transplant program that became really probably, over the next 10 years, the preeminent innovative liver transplant program in the world. The first series of segmental liver transplants was done here. The first series of split liver transplants in the world was done here. The first series of living donor liver transplants in the world was done here. And it was done, done during that period of time that Dick was a junior uh, faculty attending and I was a fellow. And so these guys were all here at the same time. Um, not all of the picks, guys that came through here are here, but I just wanted to point out a few of them. A lot of you know these faces, but I want to tell you where they are now and what they do. This guy was uh, one of the first fellows. Um, I'm not sure if Dick really, you were the first fellow, but you were sort of a junior faculty, but not really a fellow, right? And then right behind Dick was Johnny Moan. John is now the chief of transplant at Columbia University in New York. Uh, I came and um, Osama Gaber was in between. Osama is now the uh, chairman of uh, chief of transplantation at Methodist Hospital uh, in Houston, and he's a vice chair there. Uh, following me was Tom Heffron. Tom spent about 15 years running the pediatric liver transplant program at Emory University. He's now starting a program in Denver. Uh, behind Tom, there was a, this guy here, who, as you know, is now the Giuliano Testa is now the director of living donor liver transplantation in one of the largest programs in the country. Uh, at Baylor University Medical Center in Dallas. George Loss is now the chairman of surgery. He was the chief of transplant for a number of years at Oxner Clinic, is now the chairman of surgery at Oxner Clinic in New Orleans. Dave Cronin's the head of liver transplant at Medical College of Wisconsin. This guy, Xavier Rogiers, was just behind these guys. Uh, he is actually now chief of transplant at the University of Leuven in Belgium. Max Malago is the head of hepatobiliary surgery at University College of London. And this guy, Ken Newell, is a transplant surgeon at Emory in Atlanta, has just been elected the chief, uh, the incoming president for the American Society of Transplantation. Quite a group. And so this is the legacy that this sur surgical transplant fellowship has. And if you look, there's a lot of these faces here. A lot of these guys wrote papers with people sitting around the table on the ethics of transplantation. So the concept of research ethics consultation was started um, by Mark, um, and he and John Lantos published the first paper. It was used prior to segmental li liver transplantation. It involves an extensive consideration of ethics involving a new surgical procedure prior to an IRB proposal and clinical implementation. And so this is a quote from the paper that Mark talked to you about, the New England Journal of Medicine paper that Laney first authored. And it, and it talks about research ethics consultation. And when it, we referred to it in that paper specifically because we wanted to write that paper to create the, the appropriate discussions that should be held before a clinical trial of kidney exchange procedures. In 1989, we described a process of research ethics consultation for surgical innovations to evaluate clinical and ethical sub acceptability of a transplantation program involving living liver donors. This type of consultation en entails a more extensive ethical analysis, greater than that usually provided in a standard review by an IRB. It involves open discussions with the institution. It involves publication, peer review, and public discussion. And so that process, which was started by Mark and John here for the innovative liver transplant procedures, we then had deliberately applied uh, to kidney exchange. The concept of equipoise was actually also used. Uh, now, equipoise has a number of different types of definitions depending on, on what you're considering. But really, what I've, what I've done is sort of paraphrased it, is equipoise involves the balance between the need to delay the introduction of procedures so that you gain more knowledge about the procedure, and it's balanced by the urgent need to clinically apply that so that you can save lives. 
And so it's paraphrasing it, is basically the time to start is when enough is known and the clinical need is dire enough such that it is time to start the clinical procedure. So the concept of kidney exchange in the literature, there's no appearance before that of Felix Rappaport in 1986. And he actually had a publication and it involved mainly talking about living unrelated donors and the results needed to be good enough and once they were good enough then one could exchange those kidneys. So what we needed is was the immunosuppression to get good enough that the rejection rates were down and the grass survival was good enough that we could start to exchange kidneys between complete strangers. He envisioned a registry, he envisioned uh, two donor recipient pairs, separate transplant centers, simultaneous procedures and exchange of kidneys by courier. Now, what he talked about in this was a very small paragraph, and there was, it was really short on details. And it was a small paper, as you can see here, only about four pages. And this basically stayed in the literature without anything else appearing for a long period of time. And as you can see here, in 1994, in the U.S., there was about, in terms of other living relateds or spousal unrelateds, there was less than 10% of living donors were done with those types of transplants. However, the growth out to 1997 had gotten to the point if you added the two together it was about as frequent as a parent or an offspring type of transplant and so clearly this and actually this increase here happened to coincide with the introduction of mycophenolate and really the use of tacrolimus and mycophenolate in combination when the rejection rates got down into the teens and graft survival got very good well i happened to be at a meeting at the asn in, in about 19 late 1995 and this guy who really fathered was one of the major uh, formative people in the development of uh, human tissue typing was giving a lecture and he mentioned in briefly in passing very briefly the concept of exchanging kidneys and so I actually walked out of the lecture and bumped into a nephrologist who I've worked with for, for a number of years in Cincinnati now I wasn't in Cincinnati then but I knew Roy first and I said Roy have you heard of this before and he says you know Steve what People have talked about that off and on, but nobody's really written about it, and nobody really knows what to do with it. And then I said, well, this really sounds like a good idea, and I'm surprised it hadn't taken off. And so I came back and um, actually went, as I normally did, and went into Dick's office, and I said, Dick, what do you think about this? And so we sat down and we talked for maybe a half an hour, an hour, about the pros and cons of it, and what should we should do. And, and this was one of the, my favorite things about, that I recall the most about being here in Chicago is you could always walk down the hall and have a discussion with somebody on an intellectual level that was just um, a pleasure to have and it was so much fun and so and so Dick said it I said we probably ought to talk to Mark and he said yeah talk to Mark so then we talked to Mark and Mark said yeah I think this is a really good idea and he said and I got this young person that I'd really like to work on this that I'd like for you to work with Steve and so Laney really did all the heavy lifting on this I did some of the uh, background scientific data and everything. And so um, she really, um, it, it was really a pleasure to, to do that. And what happened was is about halfway into it, we'd been working on it for a few months. And, and Mark came up and said, you know, I think we may be able to get this in the New England Journal. And I said, no way. And he said, yeah, I got some connections and it is not. I said, well, yeah, it is kind of novel. And so anyway, it wound up in the New England Journal. And the real so, so the purpose of this was to establish the ethics and set about a proposal to do a clinical trial and using research-based consultation as an approach. And so that was the first paper. And um, so it was a proposal. And in it, we proposed the pilot study. Um, what we did was we proposed something very similar uh, to what Felix Rappaport had envisioned. We took the simplest example of a kidney exchange because we thought that to lay out the ethics and stuff, you need to really start off very simple. And so what we proposed was an exchange between two pairs who are ABO incompatible, donor A to B, B to A. You exchange the kidneys and you achieve identity. The problem with this particular issue was it represented only a small percentage of the combinations and really in an active transplant program, uh, only about 5% of your living donor volume can ex be expected to do this. So you need to have the only, no other donor is compatible for a patient. All other donors are, are ruled out and you've got this as one of your potential donors to be able to move forward. And it doesn't come around that often. 
So the original definition by this was two living donor recipient pairs who cannot undergo transplantation because of ABO or cross-match incompatibility, and they are paired so that the donated kidneys are transplanted into the matched recipients, not the original intended loved ones, thereby circumventing the immunologic barriers and allowing both recipients to receive a compatible living donor transplant. So the issues that we identified in our first paper are, are as follows, coercion, right to withdraw consent, privacy, confidentiality, commercialization. This has turned out to be a big issue, even bigger now than it's ever been. Uh, informed consent and altruism balance. So in co coercion, where coercion comes in is that we're, we live in a real world and living donors don't all come just wanting to lay down and give up a kidney. A lot of them are ambivalent. A lot of them may have a lot of hesitation or reservations. And when you take away, and some of them are relieved to find out that they're ABO incompatible. Say, oh, I don't have to do this now. Well, now you're taking away that excuse. And so what you have to do is build into your program and teach your coordinators and have it in, in built into the social worker and the coordinators and the living donor advocates that this has to be watched and protected. And you have to have a constant ongoing conversation with the donors throughout their workup. If they're not returning phone calls, there may be a reason. The next time you talk to them, you have to say, are you having second thoughts? You know, you have to have to, to, to pick up on the little details. And this is really critical. We didn't talk about that in the paper, but it's the practical implementation of this that's really critical for programs. So there's the right to withdraw consent, sort of the same issue. Now, you know, with our, uh, I think now we're actually going to be having formal training programs for our living donor advocates. Now every program in the country has a living donor advocate. This is their job. But now we're actually going to have to develop training programs, and this will be a part of their training programs. Well, what do you do with privacy and confidentiality? If you've got two pairs, they don't know each other, you know, how much do you tell them about each other? They have privacy. They have a right to privacy. But they also have a right to have a certain amount of medical knowledge so that can, you can get true informed consent. Um, the issue about whether or not they meet is an issue that's been, we did not address in our papers, but it's, it's been an issue that has been uh, debated back and forth and a number of different um, stances on that uh, exist now. Medical legal protection, um, when you consent them, you need, they need to understand that that kidney is coming from someone that they may not know and that there's always a chance for transmission of disease that was unexpected, and so you have to take care of that issue also. Um, commercialization and exploitation is a real issue. Uh, we didn't envision it back then, but now there are kidney exchange programs in the United States where the donor and recipient's pictures will be put on a website afterwards, um, and um, I'm not sure that all of the proper protections are in place, but those examples are used to try to recruit additional people to participate. <laughs> so there's a potential for a NOTA violation with this. Uh, we actually considered that in the paper. We rejected uh, the possibility that this actually violated NOTA, but it remained an issue for a while, and the U.S. Department of Justice actually uh, kept an eye on this for a number of years. So here's what we said about the future. We were worried that some support groups may seek to assemble their own uh, paired uh, matches. People might advertise on the internet. Transplantation teams um, had to, to accept that, that such exchanges had to take on the responsibility of ensuring that participation was voluntary and that the members of each donor and recipient pair had a personal and not a commercial relationship. In other words, there weren't donors that were being paid. So our proposal for a registry, we didn't support that. We actually, what we supported was individual centers like our own should initiate their own small programs and do it under a controlled setting. The problem with this was, was that we didn't understand how few patients there would be and that small transplant programs probably couldn't generate the volume of patients necessary to achieve the matches. Um, and this is not so much for ABO, but much more important when it comes to the highly HLA sensitized patient. So after that, Laney got invited to, uh, to write a book chapter. And so the next thing I knew, we were writing a book chapter. Um, we then came into the issue to address the issue of participation of compatible donor recipient pairs and altruism imbalance. So the idea with this is that you may be able to drive more matches 
if you don't have to wait for two pairs that are incompatible. If you have a compatible pair that can participate, then you can get more matches and get more transplants done. For example, in this, in this scenario, this is the first scenario we talked about, both of these pairs can't have a transplant. So the amount of altruism on, on each one of these donors is equal. But if you have a transplant, for example, if you, need an, uh, if you have an O recipient that needs an O kidney, this O donor can donate not only to their recipient, but also to this one. So this transplant could go ahead. So that's participation by a compatible pair. And the, the amount of altruism required on the part of this donor is substantially greater than this one. So we considered that. Um, and, and it created a problem, and this actual O donor problem remains an unsolved problem today in kidney exchange. One of the things that is the, the greatest demand in a kidney exchange program is the demand for O blood group kidneys. It's, a, it's the same as the national wait list. And so this problem is not completely solved. We've, we've come up with a few strategies. This participation of compatible pairs is one of the most effective ways to deal with this. There's a balance that's starting to swing ethically in the transplant community. We won't be able to touch on it all to, because of the time limits today. Um, but the original rejection uh, that Laney and I published um, um, is, has been under somewhat of an attack, if you will. Uh, it's intellectual. Um, and um, what's driving that is the perceived need to drive the transplants. So a couple of the approaches that we proposed to mitigate this O blood group shortage was you, patients, allowing patients to participate who had a positive cross match against their donor. In other words, they had HLA antibodies. They were ABO compatible, but they had HLA antibodies. So that has a group of O donors that are in it. And so some O kidneys can come from theirs. Another approach that we suggested, if you take families where there's multiple donors, up front, before you evaluate everybody, you tell the family and consent them and tell them that if one of you has an O blood group, we're going to encourage you to be the one to donate. Okay? So that's, that's a thing you have to be really careful about. But those two solutions were things that we proposed and talked about. And so the next thing that we dealt with was wait list paired donation programs, where this is a situation where you have a living donor and a recipient and you donate a kidney to the wait list and then your recipient goes up in priority and gets a kidney from a deceased donor. The problem with this is the quality of a deceased donor is nowhere near that of a living donor. We actually rejected this uh, in, a, in, in the same paper um, and uh, despite the fact that we rejected it, it actually got incorporated in the first multi-center kidney exchange program in the United States, the New England program. So. Um, then the next thing that happened is the economists got interested. And so we're going to talk a little bit about economists. You know, econ there's a, all kinds of economists crawling around this place. When, we got it, there's, uh, when they heard about them, they consider all these things a market. Okay? They, they, they don't understand what ethics is really that well. They view the whole world as a market. Uh, they're really not that bad. But so Stephanos actually ended up calling Laney and saying, hey, I can model this issue uh, about preferential use of, a, of an O donor within a group of donors. And um, so he did some modeling and looked at what the negative effects were on the O wait list with wait list exchanges uh, and found that indeed uh, this O preferred type of living donor thing can help uh, mitigate these effects. So when New England got ready to establish their program, they had a, a, a conference. They brought together all of the programs in the New England Organ Bank, which is UNOS Region 1. And I strongly advocated against a wait list exchange in that program. Despite my best efforts, they went ahead and did it anyway. And they published uh, those effects, and, and they saw that. They saw that there was a deleterious effect on the O blood group. Uh, and the way that people, the people that, that don't have kidney exchange programs that have built-in protections for the O blood group wait list justify it by saying that the volume of increased transplants that's being done justifies a small but significant effect on the O blood group wait list. So what we suggested to them was that if they were going to have a wait list paired donation, that the real issue was how long do you make the pairs wait 
here to find a match. So what happens is if everybody's allowed to bail out very quickly and just donate to the wait list, you'll never build up a big enough pool of potential donors and recipients to have significant match rates. So what you really need is this type of scenario where you've got a lot of patients waiting here, a fine filter and highly restricted access to wait list paired donation. The overall ratio of kidney exchanges to waitlist exchanges is a function of how frequently you find the matches up here. Okay? So, um, little did we know, but in 1991, there was a program that was started in South Korea. Eight years later, they actually published their experiences. So there were people in South Korea that were, had been doing this for six years. The problem is, is that the Koreans really didn't set out the ethics uh, they didn't perform this under a rigid prospective protocol. There was no IRB. Uh, they first used it to circumvent cross-match positive, and they first used living related donors. They did not use living unrelated donors. They actually used it to improve HLA matching. And so there are a lot of ethical issues associated with this program, um, and uh, they still, um, there's still ethical issues today with that program. So when we went to Ohio, um, people had known about our work. Uh, there was interest in a couple of centers and establishing one. Now, the Ohio Solid Organ Transplant Consortium is something you don't have an equivalent for in Illinois, and be glad you don't. It is a state-mandated man group where we have, to, we have to approve, every center has to approve every patient listed for a, for a non-kidney organ. So pancreases, livers, hearts, and lungs all have to be approved by every center before they can be listed. It's, it's, it can be painful. But when we started working together, this was an obvious medium where we could, could establish a kidney exchange program. So we got together and we did it the right way. We established a program, we established a protocol, we had rules, we had ethical protections for patients built into it. It took us a good while to get it. And the other thing that we did is we developed one of the first computer matching programs. These are actually the programs that were there. Uh, these are uh, the programs that exist in Ohio. One of the things that's really critical here too is that, is that we had programs such as Ohio State, our programs at the Christ Hospital and the University Hospital and Cleveland Clinic that had substantial numbers of living donors. So we had over 200 plus living donors a year being done in the state, which gives you a good volume to help drive these types of exchanges. Here's our policy and procedure manual. And this is our matching software. This was actually not really sophisticated matching software, not nearly the type of stuff that's done today. These are fake names and stuff in here. But this is the, what you would see when you put in all the data. And this is actually would be a, you know, the patients were ranked based on a, a ranking system. Uh, the matches were ranked. And so this is uh, 408 tentative matches in a match run back, you know, so that was a fake one. But this was actually what the, the match would look like and the points. So it was a very, it was a, it was a nice system and then you could check to make sure that you weren't putting an EBV positive into a negative and those types of things. So, and this is actually the first um, kidney exchange that was done through the uh, Ohio Solid Organ Transplant uh, Program. It was done between our program and Toledo. This young man uh, wanted to give a kidney to his mother, but she was sensitized by the pregnancy and had antibodies to his, to his paternal uh, HLA antigens. This gentleman had, uh, his wife wanted to give to him, but uh, he was an O blood group, she was an A, but she could give to her and he could give to him. And we did that transplant. And she died about six years later. She had diabetes and cardiovascular disease. He is alive today and doing well with an excellent creatinine. So then we started to sort out, when we started to do this, we started to sort out that there's the issue of critical mass, that you need a certain number of donor recipient pairs to drive the match rates. And so these are actually the numbers of donor recipient pairs in every match run that was done in the, uh, for the first year in the Ohio program. So we started off with seven. We ended up with 22. The number of potential matches is here. So as you can see, 231 potential matches. The number that got excluded because they were ABO incompatible or they had an antibody that would have rendered a virtual cross match was 97.8%. But look at these. So with your, just your computer looking at the match, 98% of all potential matches, all theoretical matches get excluded. And that's the reason why you've got to have large numbers of pairs to really drive the volume. As you can see, the number of paired donations here was four out of the first 22, an effective transplant rate on the order of about 10%. I'm sorry, uh, about 20%. So if we plotted the number of donor recipient pairs here on the x-axis and the number of matches, 
This is the number of matches with a two pair type of exchange. This is the number of matches with a three pair. When you go and actually, <clears throat> this is so that this is the number of different combinations you can put together. Okay? So you see you need at least 20 pairs to really <clears throat> start getting mathematical power, exponential power. Then when you have the computer rule out the ones that don't match, you have to get to 100 to 200 pairs to start to get to where the computer says it's a reasonable match to go forward with. And this is what we mean by critical mass. And then when you actually do the cross match in the lab, then you need actually around 200 pairs. The problem, one of the problems is, is that the one population that even today remains to be inadequately addressed with this is the very high PRA patients. Patients who have HLA antibodies that react with 95 to 100% to of all potential donors that are out there. These patients are going to need desensitization. They're going to need approaches to lower their antibody levels so that they can effectively be treated uh, and transplanted. One of the nice things about kidney exchange is that the first time you go into kidney exchange, if you have 200 people in your exchange, that recipient will see 200 potential living donors on that match run alone. So there's a very good chance that that person may see a kidney that's pretty well matched but not perfect. And if you're dealing with one antibody or two, then you can desensitize that. And this is the type of approach that Bob Montgomery has advocated from Hopkins. Uh, the real problem with that, and we won't get into this today, is that the desensitization mechanisms that are currently available today are woefully inadequate to really address this problem. We really need better desensitization mechanisms. So next to come along in the field and was the, um, the computer gu gurus and uh, the, the uh, economists. And they started coming up with mathematical approaches and different strategies for trying to enhance these match rates. And, uh, and I want to go through some of these for you because some of them do raise ethical issues. So here's a multiple pair matching approach. Instead of just two pairs here, you could have a three pair donation. Okay. Now the problem is once you get out to four pairs, we had previously noted that the donors have to go to sleep simultaneously. So it eliminates the possibility of reneging. Okay. So if you do one transplant one day and, that, and one donor's recipient gets done and they back out the next day, you've got a problem. So simultaneous induction of anesthesia is something that we advocated. It's not always done now, but it's something that we advocated. When you've got eight people that need to be in eight operating rooms simultaneously and coordinated, everybody, nobody can have a cold, everybody has to be there on time, and you have to have operative strength. If you're doing this type of transplant, so we've done one of these in our institution, we had six operating rooms going simultaneously. So I had three laparoscopic donor surgeons operating simultaneously and three recipient surgeons. And so logistically, it really, uh, if you're in one institution, it becomes a bit of a problem. So computer-based optimization has really been championed initially first by Dory Segev. For those of you that don't know Dory, he's a, an incredibly brilliant transplant surgeon. Um, that's not an oxymoron. Um, he actually is the only, only physician to have ever graduated from Johns Hopkins School of Epidemiology and passed every bit of the board, all of the parts of the board. He's also graduated from Rice with a degree of electrical engineering, so he's really savvy. His, he happens to be married to a, um, a mathematician who uh, did her graduate work, PhD graduate work at MIT, so it's quite a powerful couple uh, for this field. We're really lucky they're in the field. So they actually said, we can actually use optimization types of algorithms. And so, it opt so if each one of these is a donor-recipient pair, each line here is a potential match. And this, this actually, this approach comes from a, a, an area of mathematics that's called graph theory. But to try to make it understandable for a person like me, you can see that if you take these three patients out, look at how many matches you have left. So really what drives the match rates here are these three, and they're critical, okay? So what you ask the computer to do is look at all the various combinations that you can create and look at the order in which you do the transplants so that you maximize the total number of transplants that you do. For example, if you did pair three and pair four and pair five and pair six right here as the first two matches, you'd do transplants, two transplants, okay? But if you did all of these first and save them to the end, you would do eight transplants. So rank order optimization provides the greatest number of transplants and the greatest number, and you can actually optimize this to where the computer will give you a solution 
that it'll give you the best transplants with the most HLA matches. It'll, it'll give you the best size weight discrepancies between, you can make, make any rule you want and computers can be used to optimize the results. So what they did was they actually created, using UNOS data, uh, pools of patients and living donors and recipients up to a 5,000 here. And a first accept matching scheme versus an optimized, you can see that it drives about 10% potentially more matches. And it also improves the number of HLA, it also reduces the number of HLA mismatches. Okay, and so that's the Hopkins type of approach. Then two, two programs came out and they suggested the possibility of allowing non-directed donors to participate. And what a non-directed donor is, there's about 300 of these a year in the United States. This person who comes forward and says, I want to give a kidney to just anybody. Now normally those kidneys are donated directly to the wait list. But these, uh, these programs came up with the idea of allowing those patients to donate in start and initiate a cascade of kidney exchanges. This guy right here is from Harvard and he actually just won the Nobel Prize in Economics. And he won it for his work. He created the National Resident Matching Program. And he also uh, did for this work that he did in kidney exchange. He was specifically cited in his Nobel for his work in, in kidney exchange. So this is the way it works. A non-directed donor donates here. This donor then donates to the wait list. That's the simplest type of exchange. Now, this is good because this, these people on the wait list, this is the only way they'll ever get a living donor kidney. Okay, they're on the wait list because they don't have living donors. The problem is, is if this is a no kidney, it's probably going to get used right here, and this kidney will be an A kidney. So this approach may disadvantage, once again, the O blood group wait list. And so we run into another stumbling block. Now that, that consideration has been largely ignored uh, because this is a very powerful means, but it still remains an issue that remains unaddressed ethically in the field. So this is Alvin getting his Nobel Prize, and this is Alvin, that transplant, remember that transplant we did? He actually came and watched it. He'd never been in an operating room before. You can actually kind of tell he's probably, in, he, doesn't, he looks sort of out of place there. But he actually, uh, he actually watched us do that. And it was, it was really, uh, an economist's observations on what goes in in the operating room is, is, is certainly uh, something to, uh, to experience. So it occurred to us that when all of this happened that, that there was a need for ethical <coughs> foundations. And so I called up my buddy Mark, and told him that we had put this stuff together uh, through the Ohio Solid Organ Transplant Consortium and uh, really didn't think that I could write an ethics paper on my own because I didn't feel like I was really qualified. And so he helped us with this. So we created a number of uh, definitions. Um, now, um, and rather than read them to you, I'll just show you what they are. And the really critical thing here is the bridge donor. This is the person this is the individual that within the concept of kidney chains and non-directed donor facilitated kidney exchanges that is the most vulnerable to be disadvantaged. So this is what it looked like with two pairs going to the wait list. So this is a closed exchange. It gets closed. It's all done in one day. Done. You can also have a, a situation where you have the wait list, but you have one of the donors wait. So there's nobody for him to donate here. He waits six weeks, three months, and another kidney exchange is found and he donates there, then this donor becomes a bridge donor and starts another kidney transplant procedure. This is a chain, okay? So now you can see things are starting to multiply. People are coming up with ideas and approaches where you can do more transplants. Then, so, so but this one, the important thing here is this terminates with a kidney to the wait list. Now I guarantee if that's an O donor here, this is not gonna be an O kidney coming off down here. It's going to be an A kidney or a B kidney. And sometimes, if that's an A, B kidney, that kidney has nowhere to go but the wait list. And you can't even generate another chain. Okay? Then along came the concept of a never-ending altruistic donor. That is a chain that never stops. It just keeps on giving. And you've seen the, the, the paper in the front page of the Wall Street Journal where several dozen patients were actually transplanted from one non-directed donor donating their kidney and those chains continuing over a period of a couple of years. And so this is a very powerful approach. The NKR, which is probably the most efficient and the best kidney exchange program in the country, is exclusively non-directed donor initiated chains. Okay? They are not needs, but there's a problem. One guy is the guy who decides when it terminates. And that guy is not a physician. He's the guy who runs the program. 
It's a major problem. There are no ethical rules and no guidelines as to decide when a chain gets terminated, how and when. If a chain gets broken, how does that get repaired? The decision is not made by a physician. There is no policy that governs that. So that's one of the problems with, an, with the uh, NKR. So these bridge donors, there's a number of issues that they have. How long should they wait? What is the chance that they'll back out? In the NKR, the back out rate is somewhere between 3 and 5 percent. Okay? So that means that you're actually going to lose 3 to 5 percent of those kidneys. They're never retrievable. So one group actually proposed an honor system. And so, so this, this particular, uh, this, so this was another uh, kidney exchange program. Um, I, think it was the, I think it was the Alliance. And so what they wanted to do is when a bridge donor came in, the, the thing they did is they came to them after the transplant and said, listen, it's really important that you don't back out. A few ethical problems with that. Um, and so we actually rejected those honor systems in the paper. We actually suggested that what you do with a bridge donor is you let them know up front before they make the final decision and commit, you educate them in the, in the very beginning, at the first time that you talk to them about participating in kidney exchange, that they may become a bridge donor, that they may have to wait a few weeks to several months to be able to donate, that they have the right to demand at any point in time that they can donate directly to the wait list. So you have to build in protections to protect those donors. Okay? So there, was a, there were a lot of issues with these perpetual kidney chains. Um, we talked about the AB donors. Um, the non-directed donors and the old blood groups, we, we talked about those. So what we think is really good uh, for, for these bridge donors is you provide them, you talk to them about how long they want to wait in the beginning, you check with them every month to see if they're still okay, how they're doing. Um, I can tell you that I, I know for sure that one surgeon actually had a bridge donor who was thinking about backing out in Florida. He got on an airplane, went down there and took him out for a steak dinner to try to talk him out of backing out. And these are the types of things that go on, the things that we, that we feared, and that really is that single incident that prompted us writing this paper. So I won't go into all of the other issues here, uh, but there's a lot of issues. Uh, so let me just go right here. So now Bob Montgomery has talked about combining kidney exchange and desensitization. There are a number of issues with this. Um, that's being done at Hopkins. It's being done all the time. Uh, it's probably going to be done more and more at other programs. In fact, there's another program, number of programs that have done this in the United States. There are no ethical foundations for this. The issue is what is the acceptable level of incompatibility for transplantation? In other words, if you find four donors and a patient's maybe got two antibodies against one, three against another, but they're different levels and the cross match is there, at what level do you say, I'm going to go ahead and do the transplant? Because the higher the level of antibodies, the greater the risk to the kidney. And the higher the level of the antibodies, the greater the risk is with desensitization in terms of infection and graft loss. So these are very difficult issues to get at. So what about long-term outcomes? What we really need to know is that for a given level of incompatibility, what's the half-life of the kidney? How long is it going to last? Because if I'm going to transplant that guy and he's going to be back on dialysis in six years, was it really worth it? And so these are issues that we don't have the answers to, but people are going ahead and doing this, okay? So I want to leave you with a kidney exchange, the current definition of kidney exchange. The 2011 definition is that kidney exchange is an exchange of kidneys from living donors between two or more recipient pairs who are, are, are not ABO or cross-match incompatible so that the immunologic barriers are completely or partially avoided, as in a, when you combine with desensitization, such exchanges may involve non-directed donors and possibly a deceased donor waitlist recipients that do not have a living donor that participates in the exchange. Quite a different definition. We live in a really wild and crazy world these days, but it's a real gold mine for ethicists. So in conclusion, there are several innovative approaches that have added substantially to the potential for kidney exchange. We've come a long way since that initial paper. We, we were in areas now that we never dreamed of back then that were where we would be. Clinical experiences, there are worldwide programs. There is a national program that is a, an excellent program in Canada. There's an excellent program in Australia. There's a very, very good program that's basically run and governed by the National Health Service in Great Britain. And these guys have really done it well. They've done it better than we have so far. 
The faculty of the UC McLean Center for Medical Ethics have shaped much of the ethical foundations for kidney exchange. There is a mark that's left on this field that is indelible and will uh, still has effects that reverberate today. The unbalanced altruism issue is constantly being debated. Significant ethical issues remain and will require ongoing efforts for us to enhance the benefits and minimize risk for patients. And I look forward to future collaborations with my colleagues here. Thank you very much. Um, that was a great uh, presentation. Thank you very much. My question has to do with when you showed that nice diagram with the circle and the number of lines drawn across it and whatnot. And so depending on, as you said, the order in which you do things or mm -hmm. what you're deciding you want to maximize, you know, the size of the organ and the recipient or whatnot, all those different mm -hmm. things, um, you get more or less transplants. So what I'm curious about is what is the guiding principle by which the decision is made as to, you know, what, what should it be? Is it all based on maximize the number, even if, you know, the size may not be identical, et cetera? Yeah. So it depends on, on the group that's doing it. Each group sets their own rules, and then the computer programmers, the economists or whoever's doing your programming, program the computer however you set the rules. So that's why you have to have a policy and procedure manual. And you have to have it set up so that that policy and procedure manual only gets changed by a vote of the committee, and it gets documented, and then that goes. It's just like UNOS does things. You get a policy. It gets done and then it gets programmed. Well, six months, a year, two years later, you know, the programming gets done. So you can set it to be whatever you want. Um, shouldn't it, I mean, it should be some sort of balance between the numbers of transplants and the quality. And really the quality is, is how long are they kept off of dialysis? You know, and that's where the half-life <laughs> issue is really critical in this. You really need to know what that individual kidney should do for that patient and how long it'll keep them off of dialysis. Because when you're looking at kidney transplant patients, once you get a diagnosis of renal failure, you lose life expectancy, okay? And how much life expectancy you lose depends primarily on how much time you spend with a transplant, a functioning transplant, and off dialysis. The longer time you spend on dialysis, the more life years that you lose. Um, and so how long, this kidney, how long a kidney is going to last is a really critical decision. When you've got a highly sensitized patient, these are not easy things because you can get a kidney that's pretty well matched. I know I could probably make that work. They're probably going to have a significant risk of rejection. The kidney's probably not going to last 20 years. Maybe I can get eight or 10 out of it if I'm lucky, you know, and move ahead. The other thing that's important to understand, the early data with desensitization with IVIG out of Hopkins indicates there's a 10% mortality rate at one year and a 10 to 15% graft loss at one year. So the chances of being alive with a functioning graft at one year, the best outcome is 75%. Now that's older data, it's better, but, but the really good data is derived from patients that only have a DSA and a negative flow. The ones that have a positive cytotoxic crossmatch, the strongest degree of incompatibility, results are really not very good. And that's one of the reasons why we've been dissatisfied with IVIG for a number of years and have started to work on new types of therapies other than IVIG uh, for desensitization. Where the responsibility for the donor lies. Um, and I ask that in the context of a selection criteria that we might have a different selection criteria than the people giving us the kidney. The kidney's gonna be fine, but I'm very concerned about the donor and their criteria. In your opinion, where does, where does it, responsibility for that donor life? Well, so, so if you're going to do the transplant, it's ultimately you and your nephrologist, I think, that make the decision. So you're going to have, you're going to make that decision. And our program is really programmatic. We have a group of people sit around the table. We look at every one of them. We, we, everybody's got a voice and a vote. The ultimate decision, I'm, you know, basically is me because I'm putting the knife to the skin. But I will rarely go against a strong recommendation by my nephrologist and that sort of thing. One of the things that really worries us a lot, when you see these big programs with 30 and 40 programs, you get some donors going in and going, oh my God, how did they approve that donor? We would never allow that person to donate a kidney. Um, and um, then, you know, there's times that people have said that, you know, about us. And what happens, I think, sometimes is maybe a donor's not perfect, 
but you feel you listen to the recipient and the donor and they really want this to happen and you allow that to color your judgment I mean that that's part of what we do we're not paternalistic in our program we listen to our patients and we make decisions with them you know um, and um, of course we have the final veto you know and they can go to another program but you know we try to make decisions together I mean I think that's uh, I'm not sure I mean I think that's the way it was here before years ago um, I think Dick you may remember uh, well, this is a real as you know we're doing more and more elderly donors now everybody in the country is starting to go to where they're not hesitating to allow a 70 year old to donate a kidney some there were no gasps <laughs> um, <clears throat> You may remember back in the mid-90s, I had a, a pair of lawyers who worked downtown who were both 70 years of age, husband and wife. The wife was on dialysis, just started dialysis. And they came in, and the husband was, arms were crossed. He was not happy. He says, he says Dr. Woodley he says, he says, I'm telling you, we're here. I want to give a kidney to my wife. And if you don't do it, we're going elsewhere. And they were bound and determined that they were going to be transferred. Well, it turns out they'd worked their entire lives. They were both in really good health. We'd never done a donor over like 64 or something like that. And they'd worked all their lives, <clears throat> and they wanted to travel the world together. And now she was stuck with a dialysis machine. And he was bound and determined. He was healthy. He was good. And so we went and talked about it, and we ended up doing that transplant. And they did fine, and they traveled the world for several years. But that was one of the times it really started, for me, in my mind, shifting towards where you, you really have to listen to your patients sometimes. And, and as a surgeon, you know, when you're doing something like that, it's hard to let them talk you into something you've never done before. That's actually stretching the limits. But we did it, and we still do it now. And I've done, we've done it a lot of times. Um, and, you know, we, uh, we probably do you know, somewhere between five and 10 70 year old trans, 70, 70 year old to 70 year old transplants a year now in our program. It's probably, it's, it may be the fastest growing group of living donor transplants uh, that's out in the country right now. I'm not sure, but it may be. That, that works for a single exchange, but how would that figure into somebody plugging into the chain from a 70 year old kidney? That's a problem. Yeah. That's a real problem. And so one of the things about kidneys, I mean, Dick, you may comment on this or Michelle, is that if you just take a kidney and ask if, if the person lived long enough, how long would the kidney last? And so there's an on, a known ongoing rate of deterioration in renal function starting about age, what, 45 or 50? It's about one ml per year. So if you start out at 95 to 100 mls, you know, at the age of 50, at the age of 80, you know, you may be around 50 to 60, you know, mls. That kidney will last, you know, several more years. So there's, there's extra mileage in these kidneys in the elderly patients. Am I too far off, Michelle? <laughs> so kidneys will outlast people in general if you're pretty healthy. Yeah, though I think the point I think what Yolanda was getting at is you feel very confident when you get to know the pair, get to understand their emotional link. Yeah. When you're in a chain situation where you're getting the kidney from someplace else, you are relying on other people to do the job you would do. And I respect yeah. colleagues yeah. in many ways, but if our program, for example, and we don't, we do not accept donors who are hypertensive on medication. Yeah, uh, so, so we will accept a hypertensive donor that's 50 years of age or above. Just give you an example. Of the, these are the examples of differences between programs. If they are on a diuretic or an ACE, okay, or a diuretic and an ACE, which that's the first, treatment, first line of treatment for some patients, and they have a a, a 24 hour blood pressure monitor test that shows a, a good nocturnal dip and their pressures are very reasonable. Uh, say borderline, say 140 ish, you know, or, the, or so. <clears throat> and they have no evidence of, of kidney disease. Um, if that's the only living donor, if both the nephrologist and I agree that this is something that really needs to go ahead, and if the donor and recipient are educated and they understand the risks. And again, that's in your center, but when it's coming from another center that has yeah. different donor criteria than you have. Yeah. You don't have to accept that donor. I mean, you know, you, you can always turn that one down. And we, we do have that. The thing that bothered us the most about NKR was having another surgeon take my kidney out for me and ship it from California to my center and having it land at my center with 12 hours of cold time on it. So I've, we've actually had, you know, D DGF in the first two of those kidneys that we've done like that. And you know, living donor kidneys, 
I, I don't like it when they don't make urine right away. That's not an easy thing. But um, so if you look at the literature that's been published about how much storage time, cold storage time, is safe to put on a living donor kidney, it was UNOS data, Dory Segev published it, and they used that data to say it's okay to ship kidneys. The problem is there was hardly no kidneys beyond eight hours of cold ischemic time, and when you're shipping kidneys in AKR from the east coast to the west coast or west coast to over, it's going to be 12 hours or more. So we're really in uncharted ground. And what I think, and we've made a preliminary look at some of the data and talk to people, we actually think that there's a suggestion that living donor kidneys may be more sensitive to cold ischemia than a deceased donor, than a deceased donor kidney from a brain dead donor. And so there's a lot of issues. A lot of issues with the NKR and, and, and programs that are out there. If you look overall, I think the overall good is, is it, I mean, there's been what? I mean, this year they'll do 250 transplants. I mean, you know, Laney, I mean, you know, years ago we thought maybe that would happen. It's finally here. I mean, you know, you, you got hundreds of kidneys and well over a thousand probably worldwide will be done this year as a result of, of, of uh, kidney exchange. And, uh, you know, it kind of feels a little good to have that one paper back there a long time ago that kind of started it all, you know, so. You mentioned that for uh, non-kidney organ transplantation, the Ohio Consortium requires all of the centers in Ohio to approve it, and we don't have something similar in Illinois, and that you found that problematic. And I can imagine that there's probably politics involved, and that's perhaps what you're getting at, but it would seem that transplant surgeons should be able to agree upon criteria for being listed. Maybe you could answer that. <laughs> there are some programs in this country that are extraordinarily aggressive in the donors that they'll use and the recipients that they will list. I'll give you an example. I got a guy that I've actually gotten close to. He, he's actually, we were talking about him at dinner last night. So this guy got transplanted by Ron Busatil back in 84, one of the first guys. He had sclerosing cholangitis, had recurrence about 20 years later. And um, he, he actually had a very difficult transplant. His wound was closed open. His wound was allowed to granulate in an open wound. Repeat transplant, very difficult, severe portal hypertension. And he was turned down for technical reasons by surgeons in my program. And so I actually didn't know it, but I had bumped into him in town, and I said, how are you doing? He says, well, I'm on Ron Busatil's list. And I said, you are? And he said, yeah, I was turned down in your program. And so I said, no way. I said, Tom, we will transplant you here in Cincinnati. We'll put you on the list. We get a liver, we'll transplant you. And so I went to the head of the liver transplant program. I said, listen, will you do this with me? I said, I think he needs both of us, but I think it's reasonable to do. If you, want, if you don't want to do it, that's fine. So we transplanted Tom, and Tom is alive today. But that's an example of how some programs won't do one transplant, but other programs might. But even within my own program, I had surgeons that wouldn't. And we, I came under a lot of criticism because they thought that, that I, my personal relationship that I had with that patient was coloring my judgment. Um, and uh, so I, I had a lot of thinking to do with that, whether or not I would go ahead and force that issue to happen. But I truly believed it was the best thing for Tom. And I actually bounced it off a number of my colleagues before I actually made that decision to go ahead. But I wanted Tom transplanted in our program. I didn't want him to have to travel to California, move his whole family, and do that stuff. And the waiting times were shorter in our place. So it was a better thing for him. So anyway, that's just an example. There are huge differences in what people will and won't do. I've got programs uh, 90 miles down the road <coughs> in Lexington, <coughs> University of Kentucky. And they have patients turned down for transplantation based on weight all the time. I transplant about a fourth of them as they are. The others, we get them, they, they go and get a gastric sleeve and we transplant them six weeks later. But none of those patients, if they didn't have another alternative, they would sit down there, stay on dialysis, and have half the life expectancy. Okay? Uh, smoking's a huge issue. Some people, some programs, no way. Some programs, if you've quit, if you've quit a program, <clears throat> if you've gone through a cessation program, you've tried the the the, um, the drugs, and you've made a really sincere, good faith effort, we won't deny you the benefit of a transplant. That's a very, very sticky issue. So, so there's a lot of differences, huge differences. It, it sounds like there. It sounds like there is a, kind of a political component and a little bit of. Uh, I'm sorry. 
it sounds like there's a political component and there's also a little bit of variability among the centers. But I feel like isn't having the conversation worthwhile to perhaps curtail cowboy oh, yeah. transplant surgeons? You're trying to get a bunch of cowboy transplant surgeons to agree on something? <laughs> You know, those guys, I mean, Dick, you've been here in Chicago. Chicago has how many transplant programs? Yeah. You know, through Roby and the Oregon Bank, a lot of times they have to agree upon policies and a lot of that stuff. And uh, is consensus easier today than it was back 15, 20 years ago? Or? No, I'm not, I, I think you've been saying this. I'm not sure you want consensus because the way the field moves forward is by people extending the boundaries. If we look back to when I started in a kidney transplant, no one over 50 got kidney transplants. Uh, now, how we did it then, that was probably the safest thing, but the field moves, and with it, uh, yeah. you get improvement. And if you force everybody to follow the same rules, and it's the one of my complaints about where UNOS is going, that they're not going to allow exceptions, then you're not going to change. Yeah. You, you'll be in. 2020, transplanting by 2010 standards, and that's just not appropriate. Yeah. So I think you need to allow, I don't think you want abuses. Yeah. And to the extent that there's oversight, the oversight doesn't have to be in Ohio, the oversight is by CMS now. If, you, if you're making really lousy decisions, they're gonna can your program. So it's, it's not that there's not oversight, but I think you need to allow people to try to continue to treat more people with therapies that are appropriate. It's a very, very good point. I mean, I think, so if you look at the field of kidney exchange, UNOS has, is in the game now. They've been threatening to be in the game for a long time. I was, you know, I, I probably have taken a number of hits because I've said openly and, and strongly opposed UNOS being involved. And the reason why is UNOS has a huge bureaucracy. Anytime you want to change a policy, it takes six committees to approve it and a year to change the policy. If you take that sort of bureaucracy and put it upon a program, a, a field that is formative, that's rapidly changing, and you, you will stifle innovation. And so maybe in another five to 10 years will be a time for UNOS to really get into this game. But if you look at the UNOS program that exists now, it's been in existence for going on its fourth year. They've done 20 transplants, 25. Garrett Hill's going to do 300 this year. That's the potential and the, and the impact that, that stifling innovation uh, can have. Um, give you another example. So when we went to Ohio, um, we su I submitted a patient to be approved for a liver transplant that had a carcinoid tumor. Okay, carcinoid tumors are very indolent tumors. There, there's a good literature, not randomized, but a good literature of, of several dozen patients or more, largely from Tom Starzl's group, showing that, that they can have long-term survival with a carcinoid. And it's actually better than survival with the worst genotypes of hep C. Okay, and, but my patients were turned down. I couldn't get them approved because the other guys in the state didn't think we should be doing them. And so that really put a bad taste in my mouth. I never had that in Illinois, and I had to get used to it in Ohio. What we had was a group of programs that were really, really conservative. And fortunately, they've come back. The best thing that ever happened to liver transplant in the state of Ohio was Charlie Miller going to Cleveland Clinic. He and John Fung really helped us shift the pendulum back towards being somewhat more aggressive for patients. But patients were leaving the state and going to other places to get their transplants. And it was very frustrating. So. Um, I, I came back in December from a conference on carcinoid tumors with hepatic metastasis. Uh, the, uh, the, the results of that consensus conference, including the issue of uh, transplantation for um, patients with hepatic metastases when and when, when, when the primary is resected and not resected, will be coming out in Nature Oncology in about two months. So, um, so, so we'll, we'll have, but as you say, there's no good, con there are no good controlled studies of it. Uh, I, I want to thank Steve for a number of things. First, uh, for making the trip from Cincinnati to Chicago. Uh, second, for, for the kind words you said about the ethics program uh, here at, at Chicago. Third, for your, your contributions and, and Laney's uh, to writing about and developing uh, this field of um, exchanges and leading to the chain concept. Um, and also you know, for the ongoing work that you're doing. So thank you so much, Steve.